Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to the Physics Department Colloquium. It is a pleasure to have with us our speaker. It may be even better if I just use my own voice. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Matthew Fisher is joining us today. Matthew Fisher received his PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1986 and went on to become a visiting scientist and then a research staff member at IBM TJ Watson Research Center. He joined the Cavalier Institute for Theoretical Physics and the Physics Department of the University of California in 1993. Professor Fisher has received numerous awards, including the Alan T. Waterman Award, bestowed by the National Science Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences Award for Initiatives in Research, the Oliver E. Buckley Prize in Condensed Matter Physics. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, and it's a distinct pleasure to have with us Professor Fisher giving our colloquium today. Please. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think the first time I came to Berkeley was over 30 years ago, but I haven't been here in eight or nine years. But um, I'm very pleased to come now, in particular because my uh, oldest daughter has become a professor at Berkeley in the neuroscience department uh, three years ago. I don't see her in the audience, but maybe I'll call her out if she comes in to embarrass her. Uh, but anyway, well, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm a quantum many-body theorist by, by training and by career at this stage. Um, and what I'd like to tell you about is some thoughts I've been working on for the last really four or five years, coming out more out of quantum information theory. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, many-body theory, traditional many-body theory, which talks about equilibrium phases of quantum matter. Uh, but this talk will be about open, non-equilibrium, dynamical, quantum phases and transitions. And that's a, there's a big mouthful, and I'll tell you what each of those mean. And in particular, I'm going to focus on something called the measurement-driven uh, entanglement transition, which is something that we've uh, played around with in the last three or four years. So traditional many-body theory is focusing on materials and the behavior of electrons and electron spins, in, usually in crystalline solids. And there's a notion of universality, which I'll be coming back to, which is that basically the sum of the parts, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So for example, crystalline solids always support uh, phonons, always support uh, transverse uh, phonon modes. Um, any self-respecting superconductor, as you cool it down to low temperatures, if it's in a magnetic field, it will expel that magnetic field and exhibit uh, the Meissner effect, and this is something that doesn't matter what the material the superconductor is made of. If you take two-dimensional uh, electrons and confine them at the interface between two semiconductors, you can make two-dimensional electron gases, and in, if you put them in a strong magnetic field and at low temperatures, they exhibit uh, a remarkable phenomenon called the fraction upon whole effect. And, uh, the fraction quantum hole effect supports excitations with fractional charge, and these are sort of universal features of, uh, of the systems. Um, now, quantum matter theory, which is what, as I say, what my uh, training is in, uh, we typically look at Hamiltonians, which describe the energy, for example, of interacting spins, of electron spins in a crystalline solid. Uh, we might focus on the ground states or thermal equilibrium states. And uh, we often characterize the different phases that you can see in the phase transition by uh, what are called order parameters. Uh, for example, for a ferromagnet, the order parameter is the, uh, the magnetization itself, uh, which is the trace of the equilibrium density matrix times the, the spin of the electrons. Now, in the last 10 years or so, there's been some remarkable progress in uh, new experimental platforms. Hello, Yvette. <laughs> My wonderful daughter, thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the <laughs> um, new experimental platforms for many body physics. Um, uh, in the so called, what we are now in the noisy intermediate scale quantum computer uh, era, uh, superconducting qubit arrays, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, but also ultra-cold atoms, which have been around a little bit longer. Uh, trapped ion quantum computers are pretty remarkable, and 
Perhaps most recently, and maybe the, even the most exciting, are uh, Rydberg atom arrays, where each atom is held in an optical tweezer separately. And these atoms can be moved around and made to interact with one another through, through laser light. So these new experimental platforms lead to a lot of new opportunities for quantum many-body uh, theory. Uh, so, but things have changed. Rather than working with quantum Hamiltonians, we are looking typically at quantum circuits. So here in this circuit, time is running in the vertical direction. And here, space, or qubit number, is in the horizontal direction. And this is to depict a computation that would be performed on a quantum simulator, for example, or a quantum computer. Uh, rather than looking at ground states in equilibrium, uh, we would typically be looking at non-equilibrium dynamics of open quantum systems. And that's really rather important that in any real quantum computer, there's always an environment which interacts with the, the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. And in particular, what I want to focus on is the role of measurement. Um, coming out of condensed matter physics, I always thought measurements were something you do to learn about the physical system. You have a physical system, you want to learn about it, so you make measurements. But you can actually turn that around on its head and view measurements as a way to drive the actual dynamics of the system, particularly quantum measurements, which is what we're going to be talking about. So quantum measurements can, be, can actually be part of the quantum dynamics in addition to sort of the unitary time evolution that one would have with a time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation. So measurements are going to play an absolutely central role, what I say. Uh, and finally, rather than looking at order parameters, uh, which are like the magnetization, which are linear in the density matrix here, density matrix to the first power, uh, one is interested often in quantum information theoretic quantities, like the entanglement entropy, uh, which is given by trace of rho log rho, which is nonlinear in the density matrix. And I'll come back to quantities which are nonlinear in the density matrix repeatedly. But so before doing that, let me in fact talk about entropy, not uh, in quantum entanglement entropy, but just thermal entropy. So if you just have a system which is in thermal equilibrium with a, with a bath at some temperature KBT, uh, when we typically describe that with a mixed state density matrix, rho thermal, given by the exponential of the beta times the Hamiltonian. Um, and if one uh, worked out, or when some sense situations can measure the entropy, the thermal entropy, it's going to be extensive. If you make the system twice as big, the entropy, entropy is twice as big. Uh, so that's the entropy from counting of states, the number of states that are accessible at a given temperature range. But what I want to talk about is not thermal entropy, but entanglement entropy. So entanglement entropy is kind of neat because you imagine a big box here with a Hamiltonian, let's say, describing some dynamics. And let's put the system in a, just a pure quantum state psi. Could be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. It doesn't need to be. Um, and what one looks at is one by partitions a system into some region A and the rest of the system in region B, uh, one constructs the pure state density matrix which is just another way, essentially, to, to write the wave function when it's a pure state, uh, one spatially by partitions and looks at or computes the reduced density matrix by tracing out the degrees of freedom outside of this region A. And from that, from the reduced density matrix source of A, one can define the entanglement entropy, uh, as I've done here, trace of A, rho A log rho A. And the entanglement entropy basically measures or tells one that some indication of how the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom inside region A are correlated or quantum mechanically entangled with the degrees of freedom outside region A. Now, if you took a Hamiltonian and looked at its ground state, uh, it turns out ground states manifest a lot of spatial locality. And so the, typically, uh, it's only the degrees of freedom, the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom, which are right near the boundary in region A which are entangled with those just across the boundary. Uh, and so one calls that having an area law entanglement entropy, because the entanglement entropy for a region of size L in dimensionality D is proportional to the actual surface area of this region A. So that's short-ranged entanglement. But if you look at highly excited eigenstates with finite energy density, then you have a rather remarkable uh, feature which is something called volume law entanglement entropy, where essentially, you know, you can think of it as every quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in 
region A are entangled with the degrees of freedom outside a region A. Um, so that's the difference between area law entanglement entropy, not very entangled, uh, and volume law entanglement entropy, you know, very, very extensively entangled. Um, okay. So what I want to do now is turn to qubits um, and a little bit of quantum information. Uh, so you know, uh, our qubit ha it has a Hilbert space dimensionality two, uh, <coughs> basis states of zero and one, and one can perform a unitary gates, a, a dynamical gate on a qubit. Uh, here time's running in the horizontal direction, and here u indicates that there's a unitary operator acting on the input uh, qubit state. Uh, one can also consider multiple qubit states, multiple qubits, so here's a a little circuit with two qubits uh, sending in an input state, which is, I have written down the most general two qubit state. Uh, you send in an input qubit state. It's acted on by a unitary time evolution, which is just basically like the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And it gives some output uh, state. Uh, and these are little, you know, tiny examples of quantum circuits. Okay, but I really want to focus on many body systems, so where you have many, many qubits, you know, 10, 20, 40, maybe even more. Um, and so let me consider the dynamics when one has many qubits. And not thinking about an open system, let me consider a closed system uh, first. Um, so here I've drawn time running vertically, and across the bottom here, these red dots are supposed to represent qubits in some initial input state, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It's like all the qubits having spin up, if you will. And then when runs the, a circuit, uh, as a function of time, these red rectangles are two qubit unitary uh, gates. Uh, and one can then follow the dynamics on, a, let's say, on your classical computer. One could do this uh, and compute the output wave function after, the, after this circuit. Um, so the initial state is unentangled. I'm considering a product state. You evolve the qubits. Uh, here we could take these to be some random unitary circuit. Run the circuit for a long time and look at the output state. And what I want to do and what I'm focusing on here is the entanglement properties of the output state. So you start with an input state which is unentangled. Each qubit is doing its own thing, which is just pointing up. But you scramble them through this unitary circuit, and you get an output uh, state, which it turns out is very entangled. And so if one takes a region A, or a segment of region A, of this output state, and looks at the reduced density matrix and the entanglement entropy, that's this SA, of the output state, what one finds is that that's volume law entangled. It gets very entangled. So entanglement is, is you know, entropy, and entropy, as we know, increases uh, with time. If you just have an isolated system and just watch it, uh, entropy go, tends to go up. Uh, likewise, entanglement entropy just increases as well. So you start with a state which is unentangled, and at long times, it becomes very entangled, high entanglement entropy, high entropy, very little information. It's just uh, almost like a random state. So that's, in a way, not that interesting, just to have high entropy. Uh, so I've been interested in about how to control this entanglement growth. How do we stop this entanglement growing? And the one way to do it is by making measurements. So again, measurements are not going to be used to just find out what's going on. They're going to be used to arresting the growth of entanglement and modifying the dynamics. So quantum measurements. <laughs> um, so uh, if you have a qubit, A0 plus B1, one can measure, let's say, the z component of the spin, and there will be two possible outcomes, uh, spin down or spin up. And uh, if one have, has an observer making, you know, recording the results of these measurements, uh, then uh, one says that this state, qubit state, has broken into two quantum trajectories. Uh, if the uh, Experimentalists find zero, that's one quantum trajectory, and if they find one, that's another quantum trajectory. So there's like a forking uh, that's going on right here. Uh, you can also look at measurements via density matrices, um, and uh, sometimes uh, when one, I'm going to talk about now decoherence, where rather than following a quantum trajectory, you can sum over the different measurement outcomes. Uh, 
And that actually is a way to saying that the information uh, is lost, uh, lost into the bar. So, uh, so that's uh, a way to think about measurements, but I want to come back to entanglement. Okay, so remember we had this circuit and it just, the qubits got entangled, but now we're going to be making uh, measurements. And what's the effect of measurements on entanglement? Well, so imagine we have our two favorite uh, quantum information uh, theorists, Alice and Bob, who each have a qubit. And if, it, if they had prepared the two-qubit state in a very special entangled pair, which is called a, a Bell pair, then uh, they can work out how much entanglement uh, Alice's spin has with Bob's spin, or Alice's qubit with Bob's qubit. And the entanglement entropy in a, one of these Bell pair states will be maximum. It's log two. High entanglement entropy, low information. Here, Alice doesn't have much information about her spin because half of it, the other, it, it's shared in a, in a two qubit state with Bob's spin. Okay, but what about measurements? Now, let's say Alice measures her spin and she finds her spin up. Then Bob's, if, if it's in a bell pass state, his will also be up. So after the measurements, uh, the entanglement has, has ceased to exist. Her spin is up, his spin is up, they're disentangled, and they can go their separate ways. And so this is something that's very general, is that when you make uh, a local measurement, um, here Alice measuring her spin, it disentangles her spin, her quantum mechanical qubit, from the other qubits through which it was entangled. So again, local measurements induce disentanglement. And what we're going to do is control entanglement growth via local measurements. Now, once one starts having a quantum system where one's making measurements, and we're going to be making sort of continuously measurements, uh, one is dealing with an open quantum system. It's no longer isolated. And there are really <laughs> two classes of open quantum systems, uh, which I'll call the first class decoherence and the second class monitoring. Decoherence is probably you know, more commonly studied, maybe more familiar, uh, where one has some qubits which even if you start with them in a, just a pure state, uh, if they're coupled to an environment, maybe these could be electron spins coupled to phonons in a solid, for example, the information stored in the initial state of the spins is lost into the environment. The density matrix becomes what's called mixed due to that uncertainty, a classical uncertainty, uh, and the density matrix evolves with not with the Schrodinger equation in this case, but with something called the Lindblad equation. And one thing that happens is when you have a system, a quantum system interacting with an environment leading to decoherence, is that much of the physics of the quantum system gets washed out. Phases and phase transitions generally start behaving classically. So decoherence is, is uh, if, if you love quantum mechanics, then you kind of want to eliminate decoherence. And that's you know, a way to try to isolate your quantum computer if you want to keep it coherent, right? So decoherence is, in some sense, bad for quantum mechanics. But this other way of taking an open system, which is by monitoring, uh, leaves quite a bit of the quantum mechanics intact. So what one has here uh, is an initial pure state, just a wave function. An observer makes a measurement, finds one of two results. And then let's say at a later time she makes another measurement and finds one of two results and so forth, and follows by keeping track of the results of these measurements, these wave function quantum trajectories. Uh, and it's in the nature of these pure state wave functions along these quantum trajectories, which is where this uh, measurement-induced phase transition can occur, which, where, which has a lot of rich entanglement structure, which I'll, which I'll talk about. So quantum trajectories, just once again, quantum trajectories, decoherence versus monitoring, in, with decoherence, what one does basically is one does a trajectory averaged computation of the density matrix. So one doesn't measure individual uh, wave functions here. Uh, it, well, one measures them, but one r runs the system many, many times um, and uh, averages over all the different measurement outcomes. Uh, and then, again, again, as I say, in this decoherence, quantum effects are largely uh, washed out. Uh, and these the average value of some observable O that one would be measuring uh, is linear in the density matrix, trace of rho uh, O, where O is observable. 
But to contrast that with a monitored system, there the density matrix is conditioned on the measurement outcome. So the measurement outcomes maybe take you into state psi 2. Uh, that puts one into a pure state density matrix. Uh, one can then look at how entangled that pure state is with other parts of the many qubit system uh, and work out the entanglement entropy, which is nonlinear in the density matrix, and then average that over the quantum uh, trajectories. And these monitored quantum trajectories reveal uh, entanglement phases and phase transitions. So let me turn to this entanglement, uh, measurement-induced entanglement uh, phase transition. So I'm going to consider, just as we had before, with a, a set of qubits, time running in the vertical direction, uh, unitary gates leading to entanglement, these two qubit unitary gates, but then we're going to punctuate uh, the space-time here with measurement. So these yellow uh, little uh, measurement devices are where we pull out classical information by measuring the, uh, the Z component of the uh, qubit. Uh, so the sort of a vanilla circuit that we can consider is random two qubit unitaries and single qubit measurements made with probability P. So we're going to call P the rate at which we choose to make measurements. Or P is how much we look at the system, if you will. There's a system evolving in time, and we're looking at it and making measurements. And the rate at which we make measurements or look at it, I'm going to call P. So really, there's, in this circuit, there's only one parameter, which is P, which is how much, how much we look at the system. Um, and one can consider different two limits. P is 0. We don't look at all. We just look away. The system evolves unitarily. Entanglement grow, grows without limit. Uh, and one evolves into the volume law entangled phase. That's the most entangled uh, phase. On the other hand, if P is equal to 1, and one is looking you know, very much and ma making many, many measurements, uh, one tends to disentangle all of the qubits. And uh, there one goes into a disentangled phase or an area law phase, uh, written here. Um, and so what has been really a lot of fun to explore, both uh, uh, theoretically and, as I'll mention uh, towards the end, a uh, uh, nice experiment, uh, is to look at uh, the possible uh, entanglement transition between the volume law entangled phase, uh, when you don't look at the system very much and entropy just goes up, versus the phase where you look and make a lot of measurements and you keep the entropy low, uh, and you end up in this error law phase. And so this is uh, the measurement-induced entanglement transition, uh, which you can explore different ways. One way to do it is on a, on a classical computer. Uh, you can simulate this quantum mechanical circuit on a classical computer, both making these two, two qubit unitary gates, which entangle, and making these single qubit measurements, which tend to disentangle. Uh, and this is... Uh, numerics for a so-called Clifford circuit, where it's simple to simulate large a number of qubits on a classical computer. It's computationally accessible classically. And this is on a log-log plot, the entanglement entropy of some subregion A versus the size of that subregion A. Here, over here, there's a high entanglement, the volume law entangled phase. And as we increase the number of measurements that we make, we go down into this low entangled error law entanglement phase. So in this way, one can establish a transition from the volume law phase to the area law phase. And one can do many things. One can focus in on the phase transition, if one likes phase transitions. Uh, this black curve here is the phase transition. If we look at the entanglement entropy right at the phase transition, plotting it on, a, I guess, a semi-log plot here, what one finds uh, numerically, and we understand some of these things theoretically as well, uh, that the entanglement entropy scales logarithmically with the system size. So that's a you know, particular feature of this entanglement uh, phase transition. Now, there are many different ways to try to understand this entanglement phase transition. Uh, one is w w what I've just described, which is how entangled are these states along these quantum trajectories? How entangled are the quantum mechanical states? Are they very entangled or not so entangled? Another way to probe this phase, same phase transition is or to think about it is as a, what's called a purification transition, where rather than starting out all the qubits being in the zero state, uh, you can start in a, uh, what's called a maximally mixed state, where you have no uh, knowledge of the initial state. You, it's equally likely to be in any initial state. Uh, 
So there's a finite entropy, because there's a lack of knowledge, finite entropy. You run it through the circuit. Now, when you make measurements, you pull out information, so you lower the entropy. And if you make a lot of measurements, you lower the entropy a lot, uh, and you can drive the entropy all the way to zero. So here uh, is plotted the entropy density after running uh, this initial random state through the circuit. Uh, and uh, there's a critical value of this measurement rate, P, uh, above which uh, you pulled out enough uh, information that the uh, entropy has been driven to zero, whereas below that, the entropy density here is non-zero. And so this is a transition from what's called a mixed phase, uh, where there's a lot of classical uncertainty in the state, uh, and a pure phase, where it's just a pure, a pure wave function. Um, and it turns out then this purification transition is really the same thing as the entanglement transition. It, they're two sides of the same uh, coin. Uh, the only difference is that the entanglement transition, we start with a pure quantum mechanical state at the initial time. And the purification transition, we start with a, with a random, you know, well, a mixed, a maximally mixed state at the initial time. OK. so. These monitored quantum circuits, where, where there's unitary gates and one's making measurements, can have these uh, very interesting entanglement transitions. And there's a lot of variations of that. I'll just mention a few very briefly. Uh, rather than measuring single qubits, one can measure uh, groups of qubits. And uh, this, uh, if you measure particular sequences of four qubits, uh, you can measure what are called the stabilizers of the two-dimensional Torrent code. Uh, Details aren't so important, but you can drive interesting dynamics by just making these measurements, by making multi-qubit measurements. And in fact, you can consider models where you only make measurements. You, don't, you just look at it, but you have to make measurements in non -commuting, uh, with non-commuting projection operators. And that can lead to uh, very entangled states or not so entangled states and measurement-induced entanglement transitions. One can look at in, uh, in, uh, including effects of symmetry. Uh, particularly interesting, or the, uh, advertised, is Ehud Altman, who's a faculty member here in Berkeley. Um, it's very nice work. I'll come back to some of Ehud's work in a bit. Um, and uh, if you have a U1 symmetry, so there's a conserved total spin, to conserved Z component of spin, then in the volume law phase, in the uh, mixed phase, you, there are two, it, it splits into actual two different phases, a sharp phase, uh, and a fuzzy phase, a sharp phase where the charge quantum number sharpens up rapidly in the fuzzy phase where you keep uh, fluctuations, uh, fluctuations in the charge number are present even at long times. OK, so that's uh, some of the main things I wanted to give you a background on these measurement-induced phase transitions. Um, and now I wanted to talk about um, the experimental accessibility. Um, and uh, this is uh, sometimes called the problem of post-selection. Um, and it, it comes as, think about this as, as, as follows. So let's say you know, I could hand you a wave function or a quantum mechanical state, a harmonic oscillator, ground state. I could say, here's a harmonic oscillator in the lab. I'll create it. It's in its ground state. You know, and I ask you to measure the position of the particle in this harmonic potential well. Well, if you measure it once, you'd find the particle at one point, one place, and that's all you'd get. You wouldn't get very much information. So with quantum mechanics, in order to build up information about a quantum mechanical state, you have to make many measurements on the identical state. So I have to keep giving you copies of the same harmonic oscillator ground state. You measure it once, give it again, you measure it twice, and you build up the probability distribution is, is, uh, is follows this modulus squared of the, of the ground state wave function. Um, so likewise, uh, when one considers these quantum states along these tra quantum trajectories, these are wave functions, uh, the properties of the actual wave functions and, and the entanglement properties of what's, uh, where the richness resides. Um, and so just as you, I would need to give you multiple copies of the same quantum mechanical state, the harmonic oscillator ground state, if you're going to get a lot of information about it, naively, one would need multiple copies of each of these quantum trajectories. But that's a, a, a challenge, because if you run the circuit, 
and the experimentalist finds a set of measurement outcomes and ends up in a state psi 2, the next time she runs a circuit, she may end up in a state psi 4. And so you, you, she's generating, by running the circuit, an ensemble of quantum mechanical states, and each state is different. But if you want to measure the properties of each individual state, you need many copies of that in that particular state. Uh, so you could say, well, I'll just run the circuit many, 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 many times, and every time I find this, the measurement outcomes which corresponds to the state psi 2, then I'll measure that state, just like you measure the state of the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. And you can measure, you can actually measure using tomography. It's called the density matrix, and you can uh, calculate the reduced density matrix and the entanglement entropy. That's something that, in principle, can be done. But the problem is scalability. If you have n measurements, the number of possible uh, quantum trajectories goes as 2 to the n. It grows exponentially. And if n is 20, it's maybe 1,000 a, a uh, or 2 to the 20th is a million, I guess. Uh, a million possible uh, quantum uh, states. And so you have to post-select on each one separately and try to measure that multiple times to get uh, the properties of the entanglement in that state. So, this post-selection problem is, it, it, it affects things as far as the scalability, when you want to scale to a large number of qubits and a large number of uh, measurements. And one way to attack this problem is just by brute force. Just say, I'm going to run this circuit many, 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 many times, make many, many, many measurements on each of the post-selected states, and just uh, push it through. And this was done in you know, rather remarkable work by Austin Minich's group at Caltech. Uh, using a superconducting IBM processor. Um, and they, had some, they found some evidence for the measurement-induced phase transition, but it's definitely not uh, scalable. So how can we overcome the scalability issue of post-selection? Uh, so basically, what one needs to do is use the mid-circuit measurement outcomes. Uh, one needs to do some sort of classical processing to decode uh, the uh, presence of these quantum trajectories. And there's a number of different ways to do this. One way which has been uh, particularly uh, useful is to use a local probe. And it's originally done in a quantum ion, an ion trap quantum computer. Um, and uh, more recently on an IBM, uh, excuse me, on the Google superconducting quantum computer. Uh, but generally, uh, what one is doing is correlating measurement outcomes uh, with uh, classical computation. And this is something that. Uh, uh, Sam Garrett and, and um, oh, Weinstein, what's your first name? I'm so sorry. Zach, Zach, Zach Zachary, my, my apologies. Yeah, who's a graduate student here. Sam's, I believe, a postdoc, a, who is a faculty member, uh, called these classical quantum estimators. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about one such classical quantum estimator now, something we call cross entropy, uh, which was done with these authors. Cross entropy uh, benchmarking. So this is a way to try to uh, measure these. Uh, detect experimentally these measurement-induced phase transitions. So what is a cross-entropy, and what is a cross-entropy benchmark? Well, this was originally done, at least I found out about it, through uh, what Google called the quantum supremacy experiment. I don't know if you remember, some of you might remember from four or five years ago, it was announced that quantum computers are supreme. Uh, they can do things that classical computers uh, can't do or would take you know, a very, very, very long time to do. And the experiment that was done was done by Google on that superconducting quantum processor where they ran one of these quantum circuits with random unitary gates, some specified set of unitary gates. They weren't making any measurements in the middle of the circuit. They were just making measurements at the end. Uh, they measured all the qubits at the end and got a bit string, a, a bit string of these measurement outcomes, x sub j. Uh, and then what they did is they said, well, we know what this circuit is, because we designed it and we built it and ran it on the quantum computer. We take that same circuit and we take our classical computer and we work out what is the probability that if we ran that uh, classical computer with the same initial state in the exact same circuit, what's the probability that we would find the particular bit string outcome that was found on the quantum computer? And they call that P. And then you repeat many times. You run the quantum computer, you get a bit string. You compute classically what the probability of getting that bit spring output outcome is, uh, and then you average that probability, uh, normalize it in, in a way uh, by 2 to the L, uh, 
And then you've set things up, or they set things up, so that if the quantum circuit was noiseless, let's say there was absolutely no decoherence and no noise whatsoever, then this cross entropy benchmark would be equal to one. Um, if, there were, if the quantum computer was very noisy and was deco a lot of decoherence, this cross entropy uh, benchmark would be zero, F would be zero. In practice, F was pretty small. I believe it was under 0.1, um, but there was definitely some evidence for uh, some you know, non-trivial quantum mechanical correlations in the output of this experiment. So again, what one's doing here is testing a quantum circuit against a classical simulation. Uh, and that's what I want to do and describe now, uh, coming back in terms of these measurement-induced uh, phase transitions. Um, so what we're going to do is consider a circuit starting in some initial state rho. This could be just some quantum state. It could be all the spins up. We run a circuit with some random unitaries, and then we start making measurements, and we get some measurement outcomes. And then we, can, then we can send an identical circuit with identical <laughs> gates, identical positions of measurements. The results of the measurements would, in general, be different, as would the initial state. Um, but so we're going to run on a quantum computer an initial state rho, and on a classical computer an initial state uh, sigma, a different initial state, but running it through the same circuit. And we're going to do more or less what uh, the Google experiment did, except these are mid-circuit measurements. So we run the quantum computer. Uh, we get a bit string of measurement outcomes for these mid-circuit measurements, m1 to mn. And then we run the classical computer with a different initial state and compute if we, what the probability would be that if we had run the quantum computer on the, with that different initial state, that we would have got this outcome uh, bit string m. So run the quantum computer, get the uh, bit string, and I run a classical computation with a different input state, sigma, and work out the probability that when we get that bit string output, um, if one had run the quantum computer with that and di different initial state. Uh, and then we define something which is very much like what was called F uh, um, in the Google experiment. So this is a, a linear cross entropy uh, quantity uh, defined, uh, defined here, sum on m, pm rho, pm sigma. Now, the, the main thing is this has been normalized so that if the probability distributions of the measurement outcomes were the same for, for the two initial states, if pm rho is equal to pm sigma, then the way it's been normalized is that chi is equal to 1. And you now run the quantum computer a number of times. You get these bit string outputs, and you compute on your classical computer the probability that you would get those measurement outcomes with a different initial state. Uh, you work out chi, and you then circumnavigate the need for post-selection or tomography. And so here's an example of doing that on a classical, classical simulation. So here we just take a, a circuit, two circuits on the classical computer, identical circuits with different initial states, run both the circuits with different initial states and compute this across entropy. And what one finds, here chi is on the vertical axis and p, the measurement probability, is on the horizontal axis, uh, is that when the system size gets large, which is a bit hard to read, this is 512, chi is almost equal to 1, and then it drops down rather rapidly to around 0.7 or so. And you get these curves for different system sizes which are crossing, and they're all crossing at the phase transition. They're crossing at the measurement-induced phase transition. So there's a, if one you know, ran the experiment on a quantum computer and saw this crossing, that would be indications for this measurement-induced phase transition. So again, the cross entropy reveals both phases, the volume law phase and the error law phase, and the measurement-induced uh, phase transition. And here I've just sort of sketched uh, what I've just described in, in the numerical simulations. That, you know, for in the volume law entangled state, where we're not looking very much at the quantum system, uh, the cross entropy uh, is, is close to 1, and then it jumps down uh, to some value between, uh, between 0 and 1. Uh, in the error law phase. And there's a way to kind of think about this, which is a little more physical, uh, which is as follows. Um, you know, imagine that Alice uh, is the one who prepares this initial state, be it rho or sigma. Then the quantum computation is going to be run, uh, and Alice uh, is going to be you know, trying to send a signal, send information about her initial state to Bob, who's going to bake you know, uh, measurements perhaps on the final state. 
But meanwhile, Eve is secretly making measurements, mid-circuit measurements, and pulling out classical information. So in the volume law phase, it turns out that Eve gets no information about the initial state, right? Her pro the probability distribution function of the measurement outcomes for Eve didn't depend on what initial state Alice put in. So uh, that means that Alice's message has not been corrupted, and in principle, the message, message will get through to Bob. On the other hand, if Eve looks enough and makes enough measurement, she pulls out enough information, she can start distinguishing uh, the, which of the initial states, rho or sigma, that Alice put in. And so the message uh, is thereby uh, corrupted. So uh, now um, you might say, well, you know, if we can run this quantum computation on a classical computer, why do we need the quantum computer, right? Um, and that's a criticism that we have to face. Um, but it turns out that one thing one can do is the following. One can imagine uh, starting on the classical computer with the very simple initial states, all the qubits uh, pointing up, and taking a very special type of circuit called the Clifford circuit, so one can simulate that very simply on a classical computer, so that's good. But then on the quantum computer, we take a more complicated initial state, something that's called a mash, magic initial state, rho, where, this, where the, some of the qubits are tilted at an angle, uh, angle pi over four, and it turns out that on a classical computer, it's very difficult to simulate so-called magic states, on, even on a Clifford circuit. So one then uh, imagines uh, running uh, a simulation or quantum computation, excuse me, uh, using an initial state which would be very, very difficult to duplicate on the classical, com in a classical computer, it would just take too long. Uh, and then one's well, going to compare the measurement distribution outcomes with a classical simulation on a simple initial state. But remember, we're trying to look at the difference between the initial, whether the different initial states can be distinguished. So if we take a hard initial state for the quantum computer and an easy initial state for the classical computer, then we're doing, we're requiring the quantum computer to do the hard qu quantum computation. So the quantum computation is hard classically and the classical computation uh, is easy. Now, but before I just show you the, the experimental data uh, that was recently obtained um, on a superconducting quantum processor, I just want to address the issue of, of noise, decoherence, sometimes it's called depolarizing noise. Uh, so here, what's shown, uh, are two uh, circuits, one, both run on the classical computer at this stage, one with some noise intentionally put in, and the other one without any noise, and then try to compare the measurement distribution uh, with different, two different initial states. And if the noise strength Q is weak, okay, in some units, 0.1%, uh, you still get a crossing of these curves of different system sizes, which indicates uh, that you still have evidence for this measurement-induced phase transition the, the, the transition, although it's perhaps rounded a bit, it's still revealed. But when the noise is stronger, the entire transition gets washed out, and these curves simply don't intersect anymore. And the quantum computer, in this case, would just be too noisy. Uh, and one would have to you know, wait you know, for the next generation of a quantum computer, or think of something more clever to do, to look for this measurement induced space transition. But in a, in a you know, very recent experiment, again, from Austin Minich's a group uh, using the IBM uh, superconducting quantum uh, processor, uh, what they, they did is just this experiment where they started with a magic initial state on the quantum computer uh, and then simulated uh, a simple, uh, uh, what's called a stabilizer initial state on the classical computer and computed this, this cross entropy. Uh, there was some classical pre-processing that was done as well. And what they found is that going up to uh, system sizes large as 44 qubits, uh, although actually they were physically there were 22 qubits, the classical pre-processing brought it down from 44 to 22, they saw a, a nice crossing here at values which you know, were a little bit smaller than but close to the critical value of the measurement induced phase transition, uh, which is around 0.16. So the measurement induced phase transition uh, was observed very nicely in this a superconducting a quantum processor, but you know, not without a lot of a lot of hard work. But it was quite gratifying that this was eventually 
you know, has, is starting to actually show up in, the, in these experiments on these quantum computers. And again, what is, what is doing really is this classical quantum cross-correlation. Um, and um, okay, let me in the last uh, five or 10 minutes um, talk a little bit about another way to think about monitored systems, uh, which is using, rather than decoding, which is what I've been talking about, is using steering. Uh, so one can, for example, make a measurement of the quantum computer, monitor it, and depending on the measurement outcomes, one can do some classical computation and use some condition feedback uh, to feed into the next round of uh, measurements or the next round of unitary gates on the quantum computer. Uh, so this is a, a process which one can, you know, which is about as general as you can possibly get. You know, a quantum system being measured classically, uh, classical computation, quantum, you know, condition feedback back into the quantum computer and around and around. Uh, now this is what's, you know, going to be used for, uh, hopefully, for quantum error correction, for active quantum error correction, where you try to measure uh, the quantum computer to see where the errors are, and then you try to fix them up, basically. Um, uh, but you can ask more generally, you know, what type of um, novel phases can you can you get? What kind of quantum dynamical steady states can you can you access using this uh, this uh, this process here? These processes. And so, just I just want to mention one such example uh, in collaboration uh, with. Uh, mentioned uh, Jake Hauser, who's a grad student at UCSB. Um, and here, the, the little toy model we took was a one-dimensional chain of qubits uh, measuring what's called a swap operator. You take two qubits next to each other, and you basically swap uh, the spins the, the, on the two qubits, and you find out whether you get an eigenvalue plus one or minus one. So you're measuring whether they're even or odd parity, uh, even even parity triplet states or odd parity singlet states. Uh, and then there was an active feedback or feed forward uh, step, which is if you found uh, odd parity, so a singlet state, then you apply a single site Z gate, which basically pumps the local singlet back into the triplet state. So you're basically measuring neighboring qubits to see whether they have even or odd parity. If they have even parity, you just leave them alone. If they have odd parity, you flip them back to make them even. And you just keep doing that on all these pairs of qubits. And you ask what happens at long times. And what happens is one has got a steering going on. So uh, these, you have these quantum trajectories where you get a measurement outcome, but the feedback is conditioned on the result of the measurement outcome so that at long times, no matter what measurement outcomes you get, the feedback always takes you to the same output state. That's the way this monitoring has been set up. Uh, and since the uh, one is evolving into just a single unique output state, not just a, not a mixed uh, set of states, just a single output state, uh, one can uh, average over the measurement outcomes, basically, and use what's called the quantum channel. Okay, so the, um, the details are not so important, uh, what is important is for this particular circuit uh, and dynamics, we have um, a conserved uh, symmetry. There's a U, a U1 symmetry. The, uh, the total charge, the sum of the Z components of the qubit spins is equal to a constant, which commutes with the dynamics. And then there are you know, rather nice ways of exploring this uh, dynamics uh, using what's called a doubled Hilbert space. Um, and um, where the, uh, you can look for the dynamical steady state of this circuit at long times, um, and the, the fixed point of the channel gives you the steady state, and that's the ground state of some, some non-emission Hamiltonian. Um, and anyway, you go to a particular final quantum mechanical state, which has the following properties. It has long-range order. That is, this quantum state breaks the continuous U1 symmetry spontaneously. And this is not possible in a one-dimensional equilibrium system. So you're basically, basically sort of looking at the system and modifying it in such a way that you're keeping it so that it, that it ends up spontaneously breaking a symmetry, as I say, which, is, which in equilibrium one dimension would not be, would not be possible. 
You're also creating a state which has quite a bit of entanglement in the its final state, has a log logarithmic entanglement. Um, and you can look at the approach to the steady state, uh, and by looking at the gap of the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, um, and you, that falls off as one over L squared, and that gap gives you a relaxation time. Uh, the takeaway message here is that the one has this conserved charge in these one-dimensional set of qubits, uh, and so the slow diffusive dynamics uh, that one has in the system, and one can see that in this you know, theoretical analysis. So this is just one example of a, of a, you know, a, a feedback where one evolves into a, a simple, pure uh, state, and you can ask about, is this experimentally accessible? Um, there's some nice things about it and some challenging things. One, the, the geometry is simple. That's good. It's just a one-dimensional set of qubits. The mid-circuit measurements, which one is doing, are somewhat challenging, but can be done. The feedback is simple, so that's good. No post-selection is needed, that's good. The challenge is that you need a rather deep circuit uh, to end up into this dynamical steady state. There's lots of quantum trajectories that you can explore before you always sort of eventually evolve into this final state. And so that, that may be, the, you know, that's gonna be somewhat of a challenge. Uh, but it may be possible on either a uh, quantum ion trap or superconducting, superconducting processor. Um, okay, so let me just uh, summarize and wrap up. Um, so, you know, what I've really been talking about are open quantum systems, and in particular, the role of measurements. And, uh, you know, as I say, for my background, measurements were just a way to figure out what's going on in their system, not as a way to, gen to modulate the actual dynamics of the system. I mean, when we learn quantum mechanics, we learn, you know, unitary time evolution, time dependent Schrodinger equation, and then the measurement postulate. So measurements are the other half of quantum mechanics, and they can be used to generate dynamics. And, you know, I think you know, that leads to an open... Uh, a set of uh, interesting questions in these monitor uh, uh, circuits, these quantum uh, measurement-induced phase transitions, which you know, are now being seen um, in superconducting and uh, ion trap quantum computers. Um, so measurements drive normal monitor dynamics. Uh, I've talked about post-selection, this post-selection issue, which using these classical, clever classical quantum uh, cross-correlators can be you know, circumnavigated. Uh, we've looked at a little bit about adaptive feedbacks to, to steer to dynamical phases. Um, and there's a lot of questions here. I've just mentioned, mentioned a few. Um, I think in particular, I'm interested in these adaptive dynamical systems. I mean, there's many types of questions one can ask. You know, is it possible to have some quantum system, maybe you have a two-dimensional set of qubits, making measurements, doing feedback, doing unitaries, measurements, feedback, to stabilize it and make it look like a, a, a superfluid, make it look like a two-dimensional superfluid, which is maybe a mixed state with, with long-range order, for example. I don't know. I mean, that it seems like that should be possible, but uh, um, I'm not sure I know, know quite how to do that. So, so that's basically all I wanted to say, and I just want to, to thank, uh, these are some of my collaborators on some of the work I've described today. In particular, let me uh, point out uh, um, Yao Dong Li, who was a grad student at UCSB, is now a postdoc at Stanford. Ehud Altman, some of you are going to know, who's a faculty member here at Berkeley and, uh, and a, good colleague, a good colleague of mine as well. So anyway, thanks to my collaborators and thanks to you guys for, for listening. I appreciate it. Yeah, so is it the feedback, is it the measurement alone, or is it the feedback? Well, the first part of the talk, I was really just discussing the measurement only. You, you make measurements, there's no feedback, you just get a bunch of measurements, you run it many times, you look at these measurements, and you do this classical quantum correlation. But if you put, on top of that, you put feedback, then it, 
the game kind of changes and you can start steering the corner trajectories. But what, what, what the location, you can't steer it? With, with yeah, you can't steer it otherwise. With, with I mean, basically not really. You, yeah. Uh, in the first part of your talk, uh, you drew the distinction between controlling the entanglement through measurement or, you know, <laughs> how to explain all the coherence. And you had the example of, say, electrons in a solid and photons and so on. So my question is, artificial to some extent. I'm wondering, in the end, what constitutes a measurement? Say the, the, the interaction of an electron with a photon, does it constitute a measurement in a way? Could one imagine of engineering, a, say, a solid, which rather than taking us to the area loss side of the phase diagram, takes us to the other side, so to the volume loss side? Yeah, so when the, you know, when the photons interact with the electrons, you can think about it as the photons kind of measuring the electrons. But the information of the, or the result of that measurement is simply lost, right? And without that information in hand, it's going to be impossible to, to recover the, the, the entanglement properties of the, of the quantum mechanical electron spin. So, you know, it's like in this cross-entry benchmark, we needed the measurement outcomes to actually do the analysis. If we threw those away, then it would be like having a de decoherence and we would be it would be impossible, basically, to you know probe this type of physics or this measurement in space transition. So it's kind of weird. I mean, it, it's yeah, because it, it seems like an environment should be making measurements, and it it is, but then the information is gone and lost. Whereas the measurement is you know somehow that information is brought out classically, and we hold on to that, um, and then we can use the results of those measurements, out, the out measurement outcomes, to do the decoding. Uh, in this, uh, like this last example you gave about uh, the feedback protocol, if I were to flip the protocol and act on the triplets instead of the singlets, what do I get? Um, that's, well, okay, so, uh, yeah, so if you, when you measure the triplet, you just do a Z on one of the two uh, qubits. Um, I don't think you'll, you're not going to go to a single state. It's just going to wander around in the, in the Hilbert space, I think. I mean, I haven't actually done that, but it's, you're not going to be able to steer it towards a single state. I think you're going to get a, a set of different quantum trajectories, and it's going to you know, form a mixed state, if you will. Um, but I, I want to think about that a little bit more. But I, it's, it's, you know, it's chosen rather particularly in a particular way with this. You know, if you get the singlet, you do the feedback to make it a triplet. Um, yeah. But you know, if I wanted to stabilize the ground state of the Pampa program, that would seem like the right. Feedback. Yeah, no, I know. And so you could, I mean, you could try to do it with post selection. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so, um, no, I understand what you're saying. You would like it to be locally anti ferromagnetic, I mean, and so it to be sort of local singlets. Um, you know, and you could make measurements, and if you find, uh, you know, you measure every second spin, and you find you get lucky, and you find singlets in all of them, you say, oh, well, that's a ground state of a particular spin model, a particular spin and a half anti-ferromagnetic model. But, you know, but I think if you if you you don't get the singlets, you find triplets, then, um, you know, how do you steer it into either a ground state or lo anti-ferromagnetically long-range ordered state? Is a question, and that, that's you know that's one of the questions I was kind of trying to raise when I had this, you know, picture of this you know general feedback scheme. But, uh, okay. Um, I guess it's going to be redundant. Um, have there been any studies of work done on different modes of feedback, wherein like for instance patterns of feedback? In the example you gave us, it was um, like those things. Yeah, so there's been some nice experiments in what, what's called state preparation. So let's say you want to, you have some two-dimensional set of qubits and you want to prepare some particular quantum state, maybe 
okay, I'll say the toric code ground state, unless that means something, but this particular quantum state. Uh, so there are algorithms that you make a set of special types of measurements, and when you make those measurements, you find uh, what are called anion excitations, and then you can, once you know where those anions are, you can kind of annihilate them pair by pair, and then you get into the toric code ground state. So there's ways to, uh, you know, th that's a way to sort of steer uh, use feedback to, to steer into a simple, you know, relatively simple quantum state. So there are different ways to, to do this, and, and then you can get, you know, more complicated states than the Tory code ground state as well in this. But I think it's, you know, largely the feedback and the quantum adaptive circuits are, haven't been explored that much. So I think that's sort of kind of wide open. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So was it with these 1D, you know, connectivity and just nearest neighbor cubic gates and local qubit measurements? Um, you know, numerically and on classical computers, lots of different things have been tried. And actually on the, on the experiment in this IBM superconducting uh, quantum processor, there was one where it was, um, it was all to all. So basically, you know, you have a set of qubits, you pick two of them at random. You, you do a unitary gate on those two qubits, then you pick one qubit at random and measure it, and repeat. And that has a transition as well, and then you can see, you, know, you, you can look at the cross entropy uh, uh, benchmark for that and the crossing. So, you know, so that's a very good question. So it is more general than just this you know, simple connectivity with a one-dimensional connectivity. Yeah. Okay. With that, let's thank our speaker again.